Okay, it's still my honor to speak on this occasion. And here's just some uh, general um, uh, propaganda. Of course, everybody here in this audience is well aware of uh, Hilbert's program and the issue of um, eliminating ideal elements in proofs of real statements and Hilbert's belief that this should be just a mere a kind of simple translation or interpretation in the sense of the previous talk. And of course, we all know uh, that by uh, Gödel's um, incompleteness uh, theorem uh, that this is not uh, general and possible. Nevertheless, uh, there is a modified Hilbert program. So even if it's not uh, always possible to eliminate uh, ideal principles uh, without any leaving any trace, in the real world, uh, one can investigate what the computational constructive content and contribution of these ideal principles uh, when it comes to uh, concrete conclusions might be. And a special case is that of uh, relative uh, consistency proofs. And um, now, however, as we will see in, um, yeah, as it's well known, that this Gödel phenomenon in Existing mathematics as currently practiced is very rare, and it's due to uh, Harvey Friedman's uh, striking work that we see now for the first time uh, this to change, namely that in the realm of uh, very uh, elementary mathematics, incompleteness phenomena can be uh, formulated. However, despite of the fact that in core mathematics as it exists, typically these Gödel phenomena do not exist, it is not the case uh, that it's straightforward how to eliminate ideal principles, even if in the end they do not uh, contribute to the content. But there is not a once and for all technique which solves this as Hilbert thought, but this is subject to complicated case studies. And I will talk about some of these uh, case studies uh, today. So here is just, I mean, Kreisel always said one should uh, replace the goal for consistency or relative consistency proofs by something uh, which has a clear-cut mathematical meaning, because obviously there is a general malaise uh, uh, about the consistency proofs and what had been achieved by a consistency proof, as, for example, Hermann Weil commented on Gensen's uh, result that this would sort of be pointless uh, because uh, the consistency of uh, induction uh, to prove by consistency uh, using transfinite induction, of course, not paying attention to the fact that Gensen proofs establish much more like characterizing the provable recursive functions of pair normatic and so on and so forth. So here's an... Uh, um, a citation from St. Thomas Aquinas, which sort of addresses uh, this uh, problem of consistency proofs in the uh, light of Gödel's incompleteness, uh, second incompleteness theorem. So instead, what we will do is to focus on uh, applications of uh, proof theory and techniques which have been used in actually Hilbert style uh, and consistency proof theory for relative consistency proofs to use them rather than to apply them to non-existing proofs of 0 equals 1, to apply them to existing proofs of interesting theorems and see what happens. And so that line of research is very much promoted by Georg Kreisel, as you all know, and here's a general slogan for this research. Now, as we saw earlier um, um, this afternoon uh, in uh, Sam Sanders' talk, uh, there is reverse mathematics, a program um, pioneered uh, by Harvey Friedman. And although that's not directly, so to speak, related uh, to uh, this applied proof theory, it, it really uh, um, yeah, provides uh, insight in this because it gives a general kind of landscape of what to expect. You have a proof, you single out the critical parts in that proof, and then using reverse mathematics, one gets sort of formal systems typically with faithfully uh, uh, correspond in strength to these principles used in the proof. And this gives already some indication of what techniques to be applied and what to be uh, expected. And so one uh, outcome of this is that typically very restricted induction is sufficient that a particular form of Koenig's lemma is weak. And it's this form of Koenig's lemma which is used normally in mathematics. To be weak, it's actually a combination of two properties. The tree has to have a bounding function on the numbers of branching, as we saw, that's crucial. But also, the tree formula has to be quantifier-free. So it has to be given by a set. And if you don't have enough comprehension, then this 
again is weak. If you allow an arbitrary formula, then already Trulstra showed that any second order comprehension can be, um, is a consequence of Koenig's lemma. So it's not a feature of Koenig's lemma as a combinatorical principle, but of that particular format of writing down uh, this in, in a formal framework, which makes it weak. And to arrive at this formulation, it was, of course, crucial to investigate pieces of ordinary mathematics and to find out that this is precisely what corresponds to the various theorems we saw in uh, Sam uh, Sanders' talk. And so in general, uh, this uh, enterprise shows that the representation of objects and how to formulate principles very much uh, matters. So now proof mining is rewarding. That's another insight from this. When you have a statement which has sort of a, a simpler logical form than the critical principle, because you have a statement which looks suspiciously of the same form as for example, V. Koenig's lemma, then it typically will imply V. Koenig's lemma, so there will not be uh, a real gain in analyzing the proof. It will merely give a construction which shows how to convert, say, suppose you can find in, um, uh, uh, for a certain tree an infinite branch, how this solves the Brouwer fixed point theorem. And so it doesn't actually uh, contribute uh, to computational uh, content. However, we know that WKL is conservative over uh, lots of uh, statements like pi 1 1 statements. And there are interesting statements of that form which use WKL and where at least it's not obvious at all to see how to get rid of this, although we know in principle it can. And so that's always what is rewarding for proof mining if you have this kind of tension between the, uh, uh, the uh, idealness of the principles you use and the concreteness of the conclusion to be proven. So the techniques to be used here are what I call proof interpretations. So they are presumably not interpretations in the strict sense of the previous sense, because they do not compute with quant uh, commute with quantifiers, but actually change the meaning. But nevertheless, I, I or other people call them proof interpretations. So here, uh, as otherwise as before, you have two theories, T1 and T2, in their respective language. And you want to set up an interpretation, I, such that every formula in one language, you assign a formula AI in the other language, such that a proof a P of A in the first theory translates into a proof PI of the second theorem. And it should be such that the modus ponens is respected, so you always get a feasible uh, translation, and so on and so forth. And so the technique uh, which has been mainly used here in this enterprise are various forms of realizability, and in particular of Gödel's uh, functional interpretation, monotone functional interpretation, bounded functional interpretations, and lots of extended and refined versions of that. Now, one of these points why you have to use functional interpretations and typically not the simpler modified realizability is because in order to analyze not only constructive proofs, but actually ineffective proofs, one has to pass through this transformation of negative translation, which probably is the trans uh, interpretation in this strict sense. And so the crucial thing then is the entrance door of doing classical mathematics in this constructive framework is the Markov rule. Now, the importance of the Markov rule was highlighted in an old uh, result of uh, Friedman, namely a strikingly simple uh, syntactic translation which established for systems up to uh, uh, ICF that um, one has closure under Markov rule, thereby separating this issue of whether a constructive proof, an ineffective um, classical proof of a pi zero two statement can be converted into an intuitionistic proof of that pi zero two statement from the subsequent step of actually unwinding that proof. Now, because the interpretation is so simple, an interesting conclusion to draw from this, and that's what Kreisel always said, is the, obvi the, the uh, uh, obvious conclusion is, well, in general, it cannot be easier to analyze a constructive proof than to analyze a non-effective proof, because you can, by some trivial translation, uh, I mean, trivial not in the sense of finding the translation, but it's you know, a feasible translation, uh, one can uh, convert one to the other. Now, that is due to the fact that the uh, Friedman translation has a very strange feature combined with negative translation, namely to create implications where you have an implication in the premise. And that's a very, uh, not very uh, common uh, uh, thing you have in mathematics. So why it is true that, of course, for 
ordinary proofs in mathematics, if they are constructive, then they are typically easy to analyze, and if they are not, it's harder. This is in general not the case, because there is a fragment of constructive proofs, namely precisely the ones in which one ends up using the A translation, for which this is as complicated to analyze the constructive proof as the classical. And therefore, that modified reliability can now be used, and modified reliability is simpler than dialectic. It doesn't mean that the whole process gets simple, because one is in a fragment in which realizability is actually more complicated than dialectica. Good. Anyhow, and that is also hidden uh, uh, in uh, this Friedman A translation and various devices in computer science like Griffin's operator and the current work by Krivin on his uh, Krivin realizability for the F plus dependent choice. There is another important work of Friedman in, on constructivism, namely his proof that if a system satisfying the Gurlian conditions uh, has the disjunction property, then it satisfies the numerical existence property. There has been recently some bachelor thesis of a student of mine who went into this and actually got complexity information and kind of what type of complexity uh, you need the disjunction property for to get the existence property for a certain class and so on and so forth. Yes, yes. I have no idea how I did it. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, uh, no, idea. no, no, I don't know. And uh, I was wondering if there's any intelligent proof. Yeah, no, but I like the proof very much. So uh, back when I was a student, I gave this proof in a seminar. So, uh, this is, uh, so typically, if people just know good incompleteness, then they can appreciate this proof. So after first course in logic, and it shows them that something very surprising can be done using these uh, techniques. And other things, I think Albert Fisser proved some, some rule of uh, um, uh, independence of premise or something can be also... Uh, uh, no, okay. No, this, is, um, this was with the A translation can be done, something yeah. like, like this. Yeah. But there are also extensions of uh, this one here. Okay, uh, so during the last 20 years or so, uh, many uh, results in uh, mathematics, in particular in nonlinear analysis, functional analysis, fixed point theory, ergodic theory, and so on, have been obtained by using a proof uh, theoretic uh, machinery. Again, so the machinery I'm using here is basically the combination of negative translations and suitable uh, dialectica type interpretations. Sometimes this Kreisel program has been criticized as being ad hoc, and however, uh, there are general logical meta theorems which actually explain why this is the case and give general macros in, under which um, um, general conclusions can always be guaranteed. There are also instances uh, where additional information depends on being lucky, but uh, to a large extent this can be um, formulated in terms of general logical uh, meta theorems. And there's some work here jointly with a former student of mine, uh, Philip Gerardi, also. There's also a close connection to uh, Terence Tao's um, concept of finitary analysis on finding finitary versions of analytic principles. For example, if you take the pigeonhole, the infinitary pigeonhole principle, um, this is already non-trivial. You need a kind of finitary bar recursion to give a functional interpretation, and that is actually very much corresponds to um, the version uh, Tao also suggested. But I don't go into this. So the framework is here as follows. Suppose we have um, a proof of an for all exist statement, uh, exists uh, about numbers, and these parameters here range over uh, objects in various uh, uh, spaces. Uh, uh, then uh, the goal is to extract uniform bounds on n, which depend only on certain accessible information on these uh, parameters here. And as I mentioned, there are general meter theorems. We have not the time here to uh, formulate which do this. So in the old days, the main format was a kind of fen-type scenario where you had Polish spaces and compact spaces, and then you get uniformity with respect to the compact parameters. But this, since uh, um, 2005, has been largely extended to getting bounds which are uniform even if the parameters are just bounded metrically rather than being compact. And the crucial thing for this is that the space is not assumed to be separable. Even if the, in the applications one is mainly concerned with separable spaces, it's crucial to faithfully reflect the fact that the proof doesn't use separability. There is also, this is also related, like how we pointed out this morning, to non-standard analysis, because there you have the same phenomenon. 
an ultra power of a Banach space is never separable, I mean, except for the trivial case it's finite dimensional. So that's uh, another feature of this. So we want, in addition to the normal Polish spaces, which are hardwired directly in the system, we add as kind of atoms uh, non separable abstract uh, metric structures. And these structures here are particularly uh, well behaved because they are basically fixed points, fixed points under the monotone functional interpretation. They also show up in, in, the Banach, in the model theory for Banach spaces because they are particular easy cases in which the monotone functional interpretation is trivial. And so what in model theory people do in positive logic or continuous logic is, is a way of specifying a class of structures which for a very particular reason has a trivial monotone functional interpretation. So that's uh, I view as a special case. So, um, but as I said, separable spaces are not included here because they would get elevated to basically total boundedness and therefore to compactness. Strictly convex gets elevated to uh, uniform convexity. Uniform Gateau differentiability gets uh, upgraded to uniform Frechet or uniform smoothness and so on and so forth. Uh, prominent in, in the model theory of Banner spaces, but it can be also done here. As I just indicated, this very recent work is the LP lattice and the abstract CK spaces can be axiomatized without any reference to separability. Good. So, when, when, how many time do you? Ten minutes. Okay, good. Uh, so, the, uh, I will use here as a running theme of the type of statements I'm uh, considering a convergent statements. Now, a convergent statement, arithmetically speaking, is a Cauchy statement. So here's a Cauchy property written for a sequence in a general uh, metric space. Now, if the proof is constructive, one can extract actually a rate of convergence, which one also can, by the way, is this mentioned here? Uh, no. Uh, then I will have to say it. It can also be extracted um, if the proof just uses a law of excluded middle for negated formulas, for example, or for existential free formulas. Or you can have Markov principle and LLPO. You still get, this is just as nice as being fully constructive as far as rates of convergence are concerned. One can use appropriate functional interpretations to do this. But if one uses, say, at least sigma 1 law of excluded middle, then there are these Specker uh, counterexamples. So in general, it is not possible even for very simple computable sequences on the real line, even of rational numbers decreasing and so on and so forth, uh, to give a computable rate of convergence. However, one can rewrite this in terms of the um, um, Herbron normal form and then ask for a bound here on this n, which is the Kreisel now counterexample interpretation. And interestingly enough, the same formulation has been under the name of meter stability uh, considered by uh, tau. Good. Sometimes, nevertheless, in mathematics, you oft, um, one gets full rates of convergence, not ne in general for a sequence xn converging, say, to a fixed point of a mapping f. So typically, if you have this, you will not get an effective rate of convergence unless you are in the Banach type situation where the fixed point is unique. In general, for non expensive and more general classes of functions, this will never be the case. However, one can get a rate of so-called asymptotic regularity. So if f is, for example, non-expensive and therefore in particular continuous, and if xn converges to a fixed point p, then of course along that iteration, this displacement here has to tend to zero. And so we will see an example for this. One does get um, full rates of convergence even from non-effective proofs if typically if the solution is unique if one has a unique fixed point and there is an interesting application to this I will briefly present but as I said if you have neither uniqueness and you use um, a substantial amount of law of excluded middle uh, then this breaks down actually the sigma 1 law of excluded middle uh, is already the uh, full case because uh, one can use a relativized Friedman translation to show the following that uh, hiding arithmetic or extensions thereof, plus the sigma 1 law of excluded middle is closed under the sigma 2 double negation elimination rule. So sigma 1 double negation elimination rule is just Markov principle. Just, just relativizes to the halting problem, then you get uh, the sigma 2 double negation. Now take a Cauchy statement and take the negative translation, then you have for all, not not exist for all. So by sigma 2 DNE rule, you get the original Cauchy statement. So. Um, 
it can never be harder a classical proof of a Cauchy statement than um, by using sigma 1 love exclude the middle. That's already the full case. Good, here an example where you get a full rate of asymptotic regularity. After all, asymptotic regularity is a convergence statement, and we get a full rate here. Here's an important class of operators introduced by Browder and Cato, the so-called pseudo-contractions or accretive operators. They play an important role in abstract uh, nonlinear semigroup approach to um, uh, PDEs. For example, Navier-Stokes equation can be written in a suitable way as an accretive operator. And so this generalizes the class of Lipschitz-1 mappings. And um, Brack considered the following uh, complicated iteration. And it has been complicated like this because it squeezes together two other iterations which work for simpler class of functions but probably do not work for uh, uh, accretive operators, but this is the one which works. So you have some uh, complicated here uh, convex uh, combination uh, and, um, and so these lambdas and thetas are certain appropriate uh, sequences in the unit interval and then that um, is under very nice circumstances converged to a fixed point of such an uh, operator and in much more general conditions the asymptotic regularity holds so that displacement tends to zero. So this is a result uh, in this area. If these conditions on the lambdas and thetas are satisfied, then you have this asymptotic regularity in an arbitrary uh, Banach space. And so you just make these conditions on something being convergent or divergent explicit by imposing the appropriate moduli and for the usual choices of lambda n and theta, and they can be provided. And then together with Daniel Kernlein, we had a paper where we actually give a polynomial rate of convergence from this uh, proof, and it enjoys this enormous uh, uniformity I talked about because it's independent of the um, operator and the starting point of the duration. It only depends on uh, the uh, diameter of uh, C. So C is here assumed to be, uh, uh, has a bounded diameter. And um, it, uh, the uh, further assumption is somewhere this should be here written, I don't know where, ah, yeah, that the operator is a Lipschitzian uh, pseudo-contraction, so it also depends on the Lipschitz constant, and otherwise only on these general parameters from the scalars, but not on the operator and on the thing. Is this, is this here? Yeah. Well, this, because we work here in this non-separable uh, uh, setting, so this, yeah. Well, I mean, we couldn't even talk in RCA not about X, um, about a general Hilbert space or Banner space, which is non-separable. Right. So that's, but when it's restricted to separable, that result should be in RCA not, I guess. By the way, the non-separable spaces often considered are good Yeah, okay. No, no, that's, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here is an example where you have uniqueness and you get full rate of convergence. That's an extension, a far reaching extension of the Banner fixed point theorem, where instead of an ordinary contraction, you have a much more general uh, condition here, namely being asymptotic contractors. That's a famous result due to Kirk. Uh, numerous papers since uh, 2003. Uh, he used uh, uh, ultra products to show that the usual Picard iteration converged to the unique fixed point and he sent that time the paper to me and said this cannot be true, this is a statement you iterate a function converged to a fixed point, I want to know the rate of convergence like in Banach, I want to get independence from the starting point like in Banach and it cannot be that ultra products should be involved in this elementary um, uh, statement. So. Uh, a student at that time, uh, Philip Gerardi, actually eliminated the ultra products and got a fully elementary proof of Kirk's theorem uh, with some quantitative information. But after all, the convergence is a pi 3 statement, so this is a classical proof, even without ultra uh, powers. But finally, using the uniqueness, uh, Ivan Breeside, another PhD student at that time, actually constructed a full rate of convergence satisfying everything uh, Kirk wanted, and there's a whole chain of papers uh, following up on these uh, achievements. So that is an instance where a proof based on ultra products has been analyzed and uh, with fully uh, explicit rates of convergence, just lack of time, which uh, doesn't allow me to, to state the rate of convergence here. This is actually very good bounds. 
yes, 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 yes. Something bar recursive bounds, so that can always be. You know, yeah, in general, one can always say it's bar recursive or something, but in, it's actually much better than primitive recursive. It's essentially polynomial in the various data. So now, uh, finally, a result that's a final application. Do you have one minute or two? Uh, a final application where meter stability really matters. So here is a so called nonlinear ergodic uh, theorem. One considers, this was part, by the way, of this Bragg iteration, the older so called Halpern iteration. So that's another iteration. And why is uh, this relevant for ergodic theory? Because if the operator f is linear and alpha n is 1 divided by n plus 1, then this iteration is nothing else but the ergodic average, the Cesaro means. And then the result becomes, as a special case, the von Neumann linear mean ergodic theorem. But if f is not required to be linear, then it's known to be false, the ergodic theorem. So one has to do something, either adding a little bit of linearity or uh, adding, um, uh, changing the iteration, and that's what is done here. And then a famous result of Whitman, which has some 400 of our citations in mass sign it, uh, shows that this converges and actually to a fixed point closes to x0. And so I analyzed this actually in generalization of this due to so-called cut zero spaces, which generalize Hilbert space in, in some uh, yeah, hyperbolic uh, sense. So here the context is that of Hilbert space or cut zero spaces. That proof uses Banach limits. We eliminated the Banach limits, so that's the use of the axiom of choice and got a meter stability result. So precisely as in, in the Specker case, you get a nice um, primitive recursive bound, which only depends on, again, the bound on the diameter, the counter function g, and the error epsilon, except that it's a bit more messy. But it's actually, basically, in a polynomial way, you change the counter function g into a new function h star tilde, and then get that gets iterated a number of times. And the iteration is actually very simple because the number of iterations do not depend on the function g at all. So it's actually still a special case. Yeah, there's a nonlinear ergodic theorem. As I mentioned, it fails if you have no linearity, but then v-convergence holds, and that v-convergence can be stated as v-Cauchy property, and that v-Cauchy property, I got a bound this time. I need bar recursion, and analyzing precisely uh, what the complexity is, I end up in Gödel's uh, uh, t level 4. I don't claim this. I have any you know, reversal that this is necessary, but that's the current state of uh, the art. Yeah, and then there are many more uh, papers on nonlinear ergodic theorems for this nice condition, which is satisfied, for example, if the operator is odd, then one gets strong convergence. This has been analyzed by another PhD student, Pavel Zafarik, and, and there are many more results in nonlinear analysis. You see, most of the results are published in journals of analysis because the final end product one delivers uh, can be written in a way so that um, the result can be understood and the proof can be followed without logic. Of course, you want to explain the role logic plays here, and even that is now, meanwhile, accepted by the analysts that such a paper, you have a five-page section showing that there is a general meter theorem and why that guarantees that this is possible, and now we prove it. So the reader can follow the proof and verify that it's correct, but it also gets a general insight in that this is not an ad hoc or scattered result, but there is a general uh, method here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, 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 I will. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, well, there are survey papers up to the state of the art of, say, 2008 and so, which is not ideal. Uh, but then I have an extended, I gave a five hour course at Oxford, and I have some 200 slides or so for this. And, and, and that might be uh, the survey paper, the best, uh, the closest to a survey paper. No, 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 no,